All right, so hopefully you guys can hear me now. Um, and hopefully this setup is fun for you guys. Uh, I do have screens and stuff to be able to read comments. Uh, so if I'm looking down, that's the reason why. Um, and normally I have a microphone, so I don't have to wear the headset, but uh, technical things. So we made a lot of progress on this stream. It's the best the videos ever looked, um, stuff like that. But they will still be um, a little bit to do as far as future improvements. Um, so anyhow, I hope you guys like the new pre-roll thing at the beginning. Um, that was kind of just thrown together today of some of the shots. Uh, if you couldn't tell in that pre-roll, we now have a drone. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, obviously, you guys can uh, participate in the chat. Um, and yeah, hopefully this uh, is fun for you all. And we have a lot of um, customer voicemails. I actually didn't think I would get any um, and we got quite a few, so that'll be fun. We can go through and listen to some of those, um, see what happens. Uh, if you're catching this late or because you had the wrong link, that's my fault. Uh, I accidentally played my own track with something I wrote, but distributed and released on Spotify um, and all the other platforms and stuff. We've used it for the Facebook behind the scenes, but I guess YouTube is more on top of their algorithm because that stream had not even gone live. It was just a preview um, happening behind the scenes, but to YouTube. And they saw that um, they saw that cl clip of audio, which was in the domain of registered copyrighted songs. Uh, and I guess they didn't put, yeah, obviously it's not their fault. They didn't put two and two together. Um, that Gabriella plants, I kind of own the rights to be able to use that. So they forced that link to be disconnected and thus the new uh, link. So hopefully that's fun. Um, fun little story there. Cool. Just trying to get some things situated on my screen. So hopefully this all, all works well. Good to see you guys in chat. Um, so today I don't really have a whole lot to go over sometimes, uh, particularly in the behind the scenes group. Um, I'll have like a kind of pre-written agenda uh, of what I want to like update our customers on as far as changes to how we're going to do local pickups or how we're going to uh, change something on the website, et cetera, et cetera. Like we did one of these live streams before we introduced the winter insurance. So all that to say, hopefully um, that was fun uh, for you when we do things like that. I get a little nervous doing these, uh, but today I just really want to have a discussion. We're all uh, at home and hopefully we can uh, answer some people's questions and uh, kind of go from there. So hopefully that is something you all are interested in. Um, with that, uh, I am going to show you just because I can't wait any longer. Uh, a couple other shots uh, I was able to take with the drone that we got. So uh, it's not a super expensive drone, but it'll do. And what was funny is I owned a drone way back in uh, college, uh, even before college. I think I was in high school, maybe college at the time. Uh, and they were really big and they had no safety features, um, just like no car before Tesla's really had the accident avoidance thing. Uh, they just didn't have that. So if you flew it into a tree, you were out of luck, uh, which makes sense. I mean, it's a drone. Uh, but the newer model of that same company, uh, now they have all these cameras on them. Uh, first of all, the drone's like this big. Uh, second of all, they have all these cameras that prevent you from running into something. So it was really hard to figure out how to tell it, no, 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 I want to be able to fly in the greenhouses. I trust myself, please don't stop the drone flying where I'm trying to fly it. I can see what's hanging, I can see the obstacles, I want to get around those. So um, took a little while, it took like a full battery life just to figure out in the settings how to turn that off. Um, but now I can show you guys, so enjoy.
so anyhow, there's that. And hopefully that was cool. So yeah, it was a lot of fun to uh, shoot that. And obviously there is going to be so much more of that uh, coming very soon. You can only take so much uh, with the 20 hour battery life. So anyhow, uh, let's go ahead and hop into your questions. Uh, we'll kind of do this as long as it uh, is still fun for everybody. So uh, a forewarning, I meant to be able to go through and screen more of these uh, and I have not. So we're just going to see how this, uh, let's just see how this goes. Uh, all right, here we go. First voicemail. Just kidding, I have to fix one thing real quick. Uh, I messed that up, so let's uh, let's try this again. All right, let's go ahead and listen to the voicemail. Hi Shane, this is Melanie and I'm calling from California. And do you sell succulents? I love succulents and was wondering if you ever are gonna have a wide variety of succulents or a few, if you could let me know. Thank you, bye. Cool, okay, so Melanie, uh, I'm gonna see some notes. Uh, Melanie was asking about succulents. Um, we have sold succulents in the past. Um, on the website, we actually tried succulents and cactus, uh, but there were two issues. One, cactus are really hard and I don't want the shippers to hate their lives. And just like the foam wrap that we're currently using, just it doesn't really do anything to a succulent. A succulent will poke straight through that foam. So uh, there is something we were looking at where it's like kind of a harder, what's known as a clamshell packaging that may let us do something like cactus in the future. Um, but succulents, I am interested in doing them moving forward. We actually have, if you caught it in the pre-roll, we have two different kinds of succulents right now that we are going to put on the website and use as a test batch to see if there's something we can ship more often. A family run business, kind of like what I said in my letter last night, if you haven't had a chance to read it, it should be in your email if you're on our mailing list. Otherwise, it's also in our behind the scenes group, which I can uh, post the link to. Uh, but in that letter, I was saying uh, that I'm trying to support other greenhouses, um, especially because a lot of them right now have uh, a lot of inventory that they're not able to move to traditional garden centers because those garden centers aren't able to be open. So I'm trying to do the best I can uh, to be able to clear out, help them, not just selling something that I know we've sold before, but reaching out to them, seeing if there's items that they really want uh, or have the need to be able to sell and try to work out a deal where um, they're able to, we're able to pay them perhaps even a little bit more than what they would normally charge um, and be able to sell them on the website. So maybe Melanie, uh, maybe we'll have succulents soon. You'll have to stay, stay tuned. Um, the main thing that kept me from wanting to do succulents in the past was just that I didn't know any real botanical names for succulents. So that was like a big thing. But obviously now that we have a, a closer working relationship with those greenhouses, uh, that should make that a little bit easier. Um, and I want to even perhaps film some video content or something with them because a lot of these family-owned greenhouses were exactly where I was when I took over my dad's greenhouse. You rely on a fax machine and a landline phone that you haven't changed the phone number for for you know two decades and uh, it just always has worked so why do anything else? So a lot of these people don't own the camera, don't have the um, maybe background in audio video stuff so but these growers are some of the best resources, I mean, you can find out there. Who who better to tell you about a particular plant than somebody who has decades of experience growing it? So hopefully that will um, be something we can do in the future and a long way to say, um, yeah, I'm interested in succulents, Melanie. We'll have to see how things go. So very cool. Um, 
for the record, there are 48 voicemails in here. Uh, so let's go on to the next one, shall we? And I do see all you guys as Chad, Stixty, uh, Carrie, and uh, all you guys. There's a lot of you, but it's good to see you all. And I will be here for a little while answering your questions. So we'll go through that. Um, All right, sorry. I do get to see a transcription of these voicemails, so I'm trying to read through one to see uh, see if there's one that I can make out is going to be fun. Uh, but let's go ahead and go to let's go ahead and go to this question here. Is that on? All right, I'm not going to make the same mistake again. All right, cool. Here you go. Hi, Shane. This is Christine calling from Portland, Oregon. Thank you so much for all the hard work that you do, as always. My question for you for your live stream, what is your favorite thing about working in Gabriella plants in the greenhouse, and what is your least favorite thing about working in Gabriella plants in the greenhouse? Um, thanks oh, so man. much again. Bye. All right. Cool. Christine, well, it was good to hear from you. Um, favorite thing... I forgot to write that part down on my notes. Favorite thing, worst thing. All right. Well, I mean, there's a lot of my favorite things. The worst thing is by far, well, I don't know. Obviously, the easiest answer for worst thing is the fact that it can be so hot in the greenhouses. Like right now, I'll pull up our, our internal. We have our weather station that's outside that you can always see what temperature our outdoor conditions are by going to gabrielleplants.com. All the way at the bottom of the page, there's a little thing that says live weather under quick links. Uh, but we also have a weather station uh, set up where there's multiple mo different uh, sensors throughout the greenhouse. And right now, every single one of them is above 92 degrees. So that would probably be the worst thing right there um, is just the pure heat. Obviously, now we're investing in more fans. Um, we finally are able to invest in some of the new roofs, um, which all those things contribute to the temperature and just the feeling of the greenhouse. Because when you have curtains that you can't roll up or your roof is both layers of poly are sitting on top of each other, um, those greenhouses are going to heat up a lot better. There's a reason there's normally a uh, an air pocket between the roofs, et cetera, et cetera. I could talk about greenhouse stuff for forever, but uh, the whole point of that being the heat is probably the worst thing about it. Uh, I would kind of dovetail that with, I think the second worst thing is dealing with other people's customer service. Like when a system of ours fails, when uh, our postage transactions aren't going through, something like that. Um, which obviously technology breaks. I never have a, I never take it out on customer service people because I answer those emails and my wife answers those emails. So I don't want to be that person. But um, I always hate when there's things that are beyond the heat. The worst thing about Gabriella is the reliance on technology that is outside of our control, I guess you could say. So um, obviously there's things we can do to make sure our operations go smoothly. Inventory updates always go smoothly given what they are, but the, everything always shows up. Those kind of things, when a system breaks that's outside of our control, um, even like the internet connection here has an issue, um, those things can be super irritating to me just because I can't fix them. Um, but that's the worst thing. As far as the favorite thing, um, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot of favorite things I like. I really like the people here. Um, I'm in our offices uh, for the first time today. In fact, um, let me go ahead and show you something pretty cool, guys, if this will show up for me. All right, let's try this. All right, so that is, it's not running live. It is on my other screen. Anyhow, that is supposed to be a live shot of the greenhouses, but I guess uh, that it was on delay. But that uh, is pretty cool. Um, being around plants, interacting with customers is always my favorite part. But I think I think favorite should be rephrased as most rewarding. And I think if you're going for most rewarding, it's just seeing each of the team members growing and what they're doing. Um, I can remember 
pretty much all of them when every species ID was a question um, or at least a double check and to see them grow, um, especially when they come and like, hey, have you seen this plant? Uh, have you ever thought about growing this plant? Um, seeing the passion ignited in the folks that work here, um, I think that's the most rewarding thing. Um, my favorite thing to do though is probably things like this, answering questions, just getting to uh, to interact with people. And since we're all at home or I'm at work, but I'm the only person at work. Uh, so yeah, figured I'd just answer some questions for a little while. So hopefully that answers your question, Christine, and good to hear from you as well, all the way from Portland, Oregon. So that's pretty neat. Um, let me catch up with chat here for a minute. Uh, Kira, I hope I'm saying that right, liked the letter. Um, yeah, I, I had been wanting to write that letter for a while, so I was glad I was kind of finally able to. Um, thanks for answering the question. Oh, Melanie, look at you in chat and voicemail. Look at that. That is beautiful. Um, happy to help. Um, all right, cool. Well, I am going to play another voicemail because we're just rock rocking and rolling on this. Uh, let's go. This one's a little bit of a long one. I'm looking for the one that I, I read, I listened to earlier. Okay, cool. Let's go ahead and listen to this one, guys. Hi, my name is Boomy, and I'm calling from Orlando, Florida. My question is this. Suppose my plant has gotten as big as I wanted to um, get, because, you know, if it gets too big, I don't have space for it in my house or something like that. How do I take care of it? moving forward. So I don't want to keep repotting it in bigger pots. I just want it to stay the same size it is. How can I keep doing that while still maintaining the health of the plant? Let me know if you have any tips about this. Thank you. Awesome. Um, well, it was good to hear from you. Uh, so the question, just in case you uh, didn't get it, um, the question is what uh, to do if your plant has reached full size, um, but hasn't quite, uh, or you don't want it to get any bigger. And that, and there's two things you can do for that. One, um, leave it in the same size pot. Um, there, our tendency is as soon as we think it needs a bigger pot to go ahead and put it in a bigger pot. And I think I'm in the same boat as that. I think even in the greenhouse, we tend to do that as well because um, it does take time for it to root into the next stage of pot size and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but you can also leave it in its current pot and that will do a certain amount to restricting its growth. Now, of course, this all depends on the plant. Um, something like a vining pothos or philodendron is not going to care, or a hoya for that matter, is not going to care if it's root bound or if it's in a larger pot or a smaller pot. It is just going to continue to vine outwards. So for something like that, all you can do is trim it um, to your desired thing. And trimming is not a bad thing. And you can then take those cuttings and try to propagate them as well. Um, but as far as other plants where you may have it in a larger pot. I remember growing up, my grandparents uh, always had a, it's not a ficus benjamina because it was green, but it was definitely in that same family of ficus trees. And they just kind of had it in the same root bound pot, you know, is maybe about as big around as, you know, a chair. I don't know what that is, probably a big 12 inch, 14 inch pot. It was in a nice planter, but the pot was in the planter. Um, and they kept it indoors and watered it really infrequently. And you're basically not giving, you're not starving it of nutrients. You want to make sure that you're fertilizing still, 
um, but you're just not giving it enough water or room for the plant to want to grow. So for a lot of species, the simple answer is leave it without repotting it. Um, for others, you may just have to trim it and to your desired height. And then of course there's things like um, outdoor, you know, your shrubs and things where you just occasionally have to go in and top it off at the top. So depending on the plant, uh, you can always do that. Things like alocasias, um, the bigger leaf alocasias like regal shields, uh, they're going to um, expand, they're going to get larger leaves as they get more mature. But if you trim, you can also trim off as long as you're in the right season. You don't want to do this going into winter because you're going to forcibly put it into hibernation. But if you trim it at the top of the soil line, it will kind of restart again. Colocasia, same thing, similar family. So you can do that too uh, to just kind of restart the plant and get that smaller leaf size. So um, yeah. Uh, I'm going to try to catch up with chat because you guys seem to be thing. Brighton's question is, why do I think, why do I choose to uh, push God down people's throats? I would not classify anything I do or say as that. I think uh, that my personal belief is that good is ahead is what I think they're referring to. And I believe that in both a, a spiritual sense that good is ahead uh, for believers. And I also believe that it's a positive mindset that anyone can have, that if you believe good is going to be ahead, um, it, it, your mindset, perception is reality to a certain extent. And if you have that positive mindset, that good is ahead, you're going to see the good that is ahead um, and the good as it comes to you in real time. So I don't ever try to um, push anything on anyone, but um, I'm also not afraid to say what I believe and that by no means has to be what you believe. I think plants are why we all, um, I think plants are all why we're here and um, I'm just glad to be able to be here and to be able to be with you guys. So. Um, cool. Sweet. Let's go to the next voicemail. Um, let's go to the next voicemail. Uh, there's so many. There's 52 of these. All right. So let's go to this one. Hi, my name is Charlotte. I'm calling from Oklahoma. Um, I was wondering, Shane, what your favorite plant and your least favorite plant to grow are, whether or not you base that on things like how fast they grow or how hard they are to like propagate and root and make new plants from, um, et cetera. Okay, great. Thanks. Bye. Awesome. Charlotte from Oklahoma. This is so cool. I don't know. I get so excited just getting to... Uh just getting to hear you guys because that's something that the behind the scenes group live streams I mean obviously there's chat and I can try to be interactive there but it's cool to get to hear your voices and, and answer some of your questions so Charlotte from Oklahoma asking about favorite plant to grow specifically and least favorite plant to grow um, I'll start with just like I did with uh, with Christine's question about worst or best thing I'll start with my least favorite I would say is probably um, the fact that I tantalizingly have a handful of variegated uh, ficus triangularis and they are just so difficult to root. Coming from somebody who propagates and grows plants for a living, they're just so difficult to root. And then even when they do root, the amount of height that they want to gain before they really start, their um, stem starts to thicken again, um, which all goes into how we would ship it, you know, and I want to make sure that whatever we ship is going to be able to uh, survive. And I think that that that's probably my least favorite because I can't get good at it, if that makes sense. Um, so that's my least favorite and they take forever and you just don't know the entire time you're just kind of looking at it and you're just saying, please, and you hope that it uh, that it makes it as far as favorite plant to grow. Um, I used to say in previous live stream and stuff, um, 
that it would be like hybrid philodendrons because hybrid fillies just when they're on a bench they all look so uniform and that's really satisfying um but more recently i think probably one of my favorite plants and and they're still in production has been uh and it took me a long time to be able to get it right but the skindapsis trubiis um those have been really were really challenging but they're probably my favorite right now just because i'm able to finally get the hang of them which tip at least for rooting in in our greenhouse conditions where it's 90 degrees um misting often um and not because the plant is super picky about humidity but because and not because the top of the soil is drying out and it needs a lot of moisture in the soil but because they hate the high temperatures so the trick is to miss them for 10 seconds you know twice three times a day just to help cut down the amount uh the temperature that they're growing in so now with some more airflow in that greenhouse and that misting i've finally kind of gotten the hang of it so um i'd say at least right now favorite plant to be planting personally it would be those um but i always obviously always love the bigger uh stemmed uh philodendrons like painted ladies and and pink princess and all those things so um but yeah those are kind of that's the answer to that question for now uh... Let's see here. Trying to find another another question here. All right, cool. Uh, let's play this question. Hi, this is Bob calling from Delaware, and I was just wondering when you might uh, have the oxalis plant available. I'm on the waiting list, but was just hoping to get some idea when you thought um, they were going to be available for sale. Thanks. All right. Uh, oxalis. So oxalis, very uh, funny that we just came out of Skindapsis trubii uh, because oxalis are the same way about the heat. So uh, we learned that last year that we were growing oxaluses from uh, babies into full size four inch from, I don't know when we first got our first batch, probably December. Bruce, um, one of our greenhouse leaders would know. Um, but the first year we kind of grew them December. And then we noticed like as soon as we hit that like mid-March and the greenhouse hit 90 for the first day, they took a dive really quick. And I don't entirely know if that's because the soil we were using was then too compact at the temperature that like the soil moisture plus heat, or if it was the heat affecting the leaves and the stems directly. I don't quite know. The only thing I know is that there is cor clear correlation between temperature and our ability to get them to look as full um, and to grow as strongly. So we do have one more batch growing. Uh, we have them where they're kind of constantly being uh, under a fan, and that is seeming to help somewhat. Um, but I don't know if we'll have another batch. We most likely will have one more batch, hopefully within the next three, four weeks, but it may not be very big. Um, and just know once the fall time kicks in, we will have them again. So, or if we can find another grower who has some, who maybe has different growing conditions. One thing that's uh, kind of different from our greenhouse and something that I want to um, not fix, but if I had, if I was, because obviously for those of you who don't know the backstory, the greenhouses um, were something that were built actually the first two by my grandpa and then my dad built the majority of them. And I grew up on this on the property that we're, we're at here. So the greenhouses, when I came into the business, were already done. That being said, if I could redo things or make modifications, which we are slowly doing, um, I've talked in previous live streams about being able to do, you, uh, convert some of our bench waters into uh electronically controlled valves so we can do some of that um, on timers and kind of remotely or just have a easier automated schedule for things um, 
But another thing I would really like to do is a lot of greenhouses, especially growing the plants that like higher humidities, they'll have a wall on one side of the greenhouse where a foam pad will sit and water will trickle through it. We used to have a greenhouse that was like this, the one that my grandpa built that's now would be, have been under the building I'm currently in, uh, but that blew, I watched that blow away literally when I was uh, like eight years old in 2004, or 10 years old when Hurricane Charlie came through. But uh, you have a, a wall on one side with a foam and, and water trickles down it, and then you have a, a giant fan on the other side or multiple fans, depending on how many greenhouses are in the array. And you're pulling the air through that um, through that foam pad. So that does two things. One, it increases the humidity, and two, it lowers the temperature by definition in the same way that uh, turning on the water on the bench is going to lower the temperature. The water coming out of the ground is a set temperature versus the air temperature. So if you're pulling air through a water uh, foam contraption doohickey, uh, I'm good with words. And uh, if you're pulling that moisture through, so the one greenhouse I know that does grow oxalis does grow them in something like that, where they have a lot more airflow and a lot more cooler temperatures, even in the hotter days. So maybe that's something we could do in the future to be able to grow oxalises outside of the winter months. Um, but I'll keep you posted on that, Bob, and uh, thanks for the question. I'm just trying to find another voicemail. We'll do maybe like two more and I'm gonna take a quick break because I have to respond to one other thing outside of work and then I'll be right back and we'll do another, I don't know, however long you guys wanna do this. There's plenty of voicemails here. Um, Alrighty, let's go ahead and uh, listen to this one. Hi, Shane. Uh, my name is Linda Karakosian, and I'm calling from Laguna Beach, California. And my quick question is, I ordered a um, Hoya Macrophylla. I'm super excited to get it. But my question is, um, do you recommend replanting your um, new purchase um, within 30 days, or I've heard some people say plant it right away, don't repot it for a month. What is your opinion on that? And also, what is the best um, soil substrate to put the Hoya in? Um, thanks again, and look forward to all your answers. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, Shane. Bye-bye. Awesome, Linda. Well, it was good to hear from you, um, and our team will be working hard to get that Hoya uh, macrophylla out to you. Um, Hoya macrophylla is probably one of the harder Hoyas that we have um, just because they're very picky about they don't like to dry out as much as some Hoyas would. The, the Hoya carnosa family can withstand drying out a little bit more than the macrophylla family does or would prefer to. You'll just get some color loss if they dry out too much. Um, but on the flip side, unlike the Hoya carnosa family where you can kind of, I wouldn't say you can overwater, but you have a much wider range before overwatering becomes an actual issue. Uh, the macrophylla are a lot more sensitive to water remaining on their leaves for too long. So one of the biggest things you can do when you're watering, regardless of the substrate, and we'll get there, um, th the number one thing you can do is make sure you're watering the soil directly, or if you are gonna water the entire plant, that you have enough airflow, um, to be able to dry off particularly the bottoms of the leaves as quickly as you can. Uh, that will make a big difference in not seeing a lot of little black spots. You may see a few on the ones even we ship out. That's kind of normal. Um, they're really prone to that bacteria. Um, it's fairly impossible to grow them uh, without ever having uh, that occur on the leaf. And you can't really get rid of that damage once it is there, but we obviously take a very close eye and make sure that any small imperfections on a plant is not going to pose a risk to the plant. And I think that's a big distinguish to make. Obviously, if it's a pest on a plant, anything else like that, or anything in general, please send us an email and we'll be happy to to take a look at a photo and, and 
you know, if there is a, a resolution warranted, we'll try to work that out with you. Um, but also my perspective is that the thing I'm doing is giving you a live plant that's going to grow more in the future. And sometimes when you're rooting in cuttings of plants, you may have a leaf that, uh, like on Pink Princess, the lower leaf may be kind of lighter green. And I typically don't want to remove those leaves from the plants, even if they don't look super desirable. And you could 100% remove them as soon as they get to you. But in my perspective, why would I trim the plant and cause one more stress before they go into a box for three days where they don't know what's up, what's down, they haven't seen the sun, um, they're a little bit shocked. Now, Hoyas travel extremely well, um, but my number one objective is to always get you a healthy plant at the end of the day. Um, so with Hoyas, you just want to, the macrophylla, you want to make sure you're not overwatering them and make sure you're getting good airflow underneath the leaves so you don't get any bacteria. You can also spray a liquid copper, um, which is available on Amazon and um, at Lowe's if you can get there. Uh, but those, that will also help prevent the, ho the bacteria damage. That being said, as far as substrates, um, I've said this before, and it's going to be in my soils video, which I am working on. I just don't have a lot, whole lot of experience with substrates outside of the handful of different soil blends that we use here at Gabriella Plants. So, and they're all Canadian peat based with just other additives at different percentages. So uh, we typically use something around uh, 70 to six, uh, 70 to 30%, 70% peat, maybe 65% peat. Uh, to 30-35% perlite or other fillers. Um, it's important to still have enough hydration for even a Hoya, even though they do get a lot of their moisture from uh, their vines. They don't necessarily need really advanced rooting to be able to survive or to be able to thrive for that matter. They will kind of seek out uh, water with their reaching new growth. But that being said, that's really the only soil I have a lot of experience with. I'm trying to get better at some of the other ones. I know some people maybe even in chat, uh, you know, really like Leca or some of the other uh, alternatives out there. As far as lastly, the timing of repotting something, um, we typically ask that you don't repot it for the two weeks that our warranty or our guarantee applies to the plant. Um, now, obviously, excuse me, if you do choose to repot it before then, um, it does not immediately disqualify you from um, the warranty or the guarantee, but it certainly makes it harder for us to determine whether the decline of the plant was due to um, an issue in shipping, uh, whether it be a soil borne illness or just, you know, the plant uh, just went into too much shock, that kind of thing. Or if it was because you did repot it, you removed all the roots, you know, you don't know how many micro roots you're destroying when you do go to repot things and stuff like that, especially when you're washing all the roots off. So you can journey at your own risk. I tend to say wait the two weeks just because we'll always be there to, to help rectify the issues that way. But obviously, if you have a particularly cold environment over winter, you're really worried about it uh, not drying out quickly enough. Um, I trust you and, and what you choose to do uh, with your plant and have fun with it too. That's the other thing. You can always break it apart and uh, especially with like the macrophyllas, there's six to eight cuttings, something like that per four inch pot. So you can break that up and put four into LECA and repot four into a normal kind of soil mixture and kind of see what works best for you and your environment. A lot of that's just going to depend on if you have good airflow, if you have bad airflow, what your temperature is, how much sunlight, how quickly is the soil going to dry out, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully that answers your question, Linda, on the Hoya. And like I said, our team will be working hard to get that out for you. So very cool. At this point, I am not going to be able to get through every single voicemail, but I'm going to keep playing more. Uh, there's also a lot of text too. So I'm actually going to read through some of these texts real quick. Um, there's a question, I don't always get the names on the text, by the way, but a question says, hey there, can you repair a stem that is halfway broken? That depends on the plant. Some plants you can kind of essentially put a band-aid around, like um, an alocasia, and you're not ever going to repair the stem, 
but you may be able to prolong the longevity of that leaf remaining semi-active, especially if you didn't get a clean snap. It's just a, a bend um, and leaving that leaf kind of in a temporary band-aid situation uh, can help to make sure that new growth isn't affected or shocked in any way by the loss of a leaf that did get bent. Um, but that would apply to things with kind of mushier stems like alocaceas, colocasia, stuff like that. If it's like a Hoya or something where the snap is more clean, there's not a whole lot you can do to repair it. But the good news is plants continue to grow. So uh, they will keep growing. Uh, and all you got to do is be patient and wait. And I'm sure that's a little bit more tricky now that we're all just at home watching our plants every day because a watched pot never boils. So uh, I'm just reading through the some of these other texts. Thoughts on soil aeration for potted plants? Uh, is it overkill, even if you are gentle? I'm not saying that it's uh, it's a bad thing to repot. I don't know if that question is related to that. I don't, I don't think it's a bad thing to repot. It certainly depends on the species, but I think that being really careful, you're probably not going to... I'm not saying you're going to cause damage to the plant. Uh, my only thought is that we know 100% that it is something to do with something we're doing um, and not something to do with its current environment. So, um, yeah. And, and in case you're unfamiliar or just haven't maybe heard me say this in the past, um, a lot of times people ask, like, well, Hoyas, they need way more aeration in their roots. Why aren't you using a lighter soil mixture? And the answer goes back to something we mentioned before, but the greenhouse temperatures and what those are every day. So if the greenhouse is 100 degrees, uh, if I had it in primarily a um, high perlite concentration, didn't have a whole lot of peat, I would be having to water those Hoyas multiple times a day. In your house, that may work just fine. Um, and you may be able to water it once a week with minimal um, water retention in your soil. But when you're at that high of a temperature with that much UV, with that much sunlight, um, you're going to you're gonna dry out those plants really, really quick. So um, yeah, that's, that's part of it. Uh, going back to more texts. I'm just trying to get through some of these texts. Uh, Somebody couldn't get into the live stream. Yeah, I know it took down, if you missed it, it took down our old stream uh, because I had, when I was, before the stream went live, I was broadcasting to YouTube before YouTube decided to put, make it public. And I played a copy of a song I wrote, but that I published with a copyright. It's on Spotify and all that stuff. And YouTube saw that and took it down. So that's why the link changed. Uh, so anyhow, uh, hopefully you're able to figure out how to get here. The good news is uh, there were a couple different voicemails. I'm not going to play them um, for the sake of the stream, but there were a couple voicemails on will this video be online afterwards? Absolutely. This video will stay up um, for forever, unless I find something that I really goofed up on. But um, at this point, I, I, I like leaving these longer form things up there. Um, I'm humbled by the ability and the support that we get from our customers and the fact that I can do this uh, with you guys is just is just blows my mind every time and just like writing the letter last night it all just blows my mind and and what our small team is able to accomplish and just with the people who are here right now watching so um, super cool let me uh, let me try to catch up on some chat let me answer some of those questions um Bought a pink princess couple of the leaves are starting to get crunchy. If they're getting in the north facing window. Interesting. Um, humidity isn't super necessary for pink princess. I do have a care tip video on pink princess on this channel that you can go and find. Um, if they're turning crispy and it's not because they're getting direct sun. First of all, I always recommend um, on pink princess if you're getting lighter colors, then you would want i would say just back it an extra six inches away from your light source even if it is a north window or whatever just back it away slightly um and see how that does because a lot of times with pink princesses people think highlight means better variegation and it does to a certain extent and maybe one of the questions we'll answer gets to that point um 
but you also don't want to give it too much light because that can cause the same lack of variegation. And in general, the lighter green color slash crispiness in general um, can be from too much light. So I would say two steps. One, back it away from the window a little bit. Um, and number two, make sure it, you're not allowing its soil to dry out completely for longer than a day at maximum. They do like drying out. They like that airflow in their soil. Um, but they're not like a Hoya where they can stay on the dry side for multiple, multiple days, especially if they're trying to put out new growth or their leaves are semi larger. Obviously, smaller pink princesses can dry out for longer without having any issues from drying out. But when you have those big, big leaves, uh, those need moisture more often. They're going to really drink through that four inch pot. And if you don't know, number one tip of all for pink princess, definitely give it something to go up on because that's what it's going to want to do naturally. And that's how you're going to get bigger leaf um, size as they grow in height as well. Speaking of which, special teaser in case she's watching or else uh, or she sees this later, there is a special guest who I will not name right now that her and I worked very, very hard on tracking down the history of Pink Princess, which I don't know if you've ever tried to search it before on the internet doesn't really exist. So we kind of have our hypothesis um, and what we have kind of put together as the explanation, which does have some Gabriella backstory to it, which is going to be super neat to share with you guys. But she recently published a downloadable book uh, PDF type thing. Uh, and we're going to have a special video real soon to talk about that. We were going to do it in part of today's stream, but technology and I'm wearing a headset and a couple things went wrong. So we're going to postpone that for a better time. And I want to be able to go over what we found with her. So that that's just going to be really cool. So stay tuned for the, the pink princess stuff. Um, let me get some drink. I'm just going to read through a few more of these chat comments real quick. Uh, Dixie's been debating pinching off her, her um, fiddle leaf fig to promote new growth um, that's a great thing to do in spring just remember spring is kind of an arbitrary um, title right so we went into spring already um, but depending on where you live in the country or in the world for that matter if you're watching this um, your lighting conditions may not have really come out of winter yet if you're still having a lot of over day, overcast days um, or your temperatures are just still kind of low remember that springtime isn't a date on the calendar it's when your growing conditions change so if you're um, you know, getting your normal springtime going into summertime, lighting amounts and stuff like that. Um, certainly consider um, doing whatever you're gonna do, whether it's repotting or fertilizing or trimming to encourage new growth. Uh, that's all recommended uh, if you're able to, but you definitely wanna make sure that your actual growing conditions are what you're wanting for, for, for that, so. Um, all right, cool. Let's go through the rest. Uh, care for moonlight fillies i'm trying to catch up as quick as i can like i said i kind of figured i had in my mind when i was on my way over here which by the way i got here about you can ask my wife but probably two two and a half hours before this stream started um just to get things ready and to to try to design it all and have it work really fluidly um but when i was on my ride over here i was like i really hope it's either going to be way too many voicemails and way too many texts and things to read through, or there's not going to be a whole lot. And, uh, cause it never is really in between. Right. Um, and there's way too many. So I'm sorry if I don't get the chance to answer your question, but I'm going to try to do as many as I can. And I don't have, I have up to six o'clock today. So uh, we got plenty of time. Not that you guys are trying to watch that much of this, but, uh, can you help me with Moonlight? Nicole's asking about Moonlight Care for hybrids. Hybrids are uh, a philodendron that definitely like to dry out almost fully between their waterings. Um, if you're getting crispiness at the edges of the leaf, you're not watering enough. If you're getting mushiness on the edges of the leaf or in spots on the leaf, you either have too bright of light or uh, not enough aeration going to the soil. So you wanna make sure that if you're keeping it in its grower pot, it should be okay with how many holes are on the bottom. Um, but moonlight philodendron is the number one mistake. And when I see people who weren't able to keep one alive is putting it in like a terracotta pot with one drainage hole, using a potty mix similar to what we would use, like an 80-20 peat to perlite, uh, rather thick mix. Um, and with that single hole at the bottom of the pot, you're just not gonna get 
enough airflow to the roots that the hybrids like. So uh, definitely want to make sure that they're drying out between waterings. And if you do get that crispiness, uh, try to water again. But they, they don't like too bright of light. Uh, definitely want to keep it moderate on them. We actually, when we replaced, uh, side note, we recently replaced uh, a few of our roofs, which that drone shot did not make it into that video we showed earlier. Um, but we did recently finish some repairs that we actually incurred way back in 2017 um, when I was running the business wholesale um, from Hurricane Irma. So when we did that, though, uh, mildew and mold and stuff tends to form. There's two layers of greenhouse uh, roofs on most commercial greenhouses. That's for two things. One, uh, double layer is if in case in a hurricane one does come off, uh, you have two layers. You can have a backup layer. Um, it also, though, most of them are designed to have an air blower that keeps the roof inflated between layers, um, which is something that we hadn't had in the greenhouses for a while, especially in those front couple greenhouses, which we use most often. Um, and once you get that lift, um, protects you from hail is a little bit easier to bounce off of a balloon than it is to just pierce straight through a piece of plastic lying flat. Um, it also gives you a little bit better temperature control because you're baking that top um, layer, which is baking the air in between, but is not directly translating that heat out the bottom as much as it would if they were sitting flat. Lots of different things. All that to say, when we redid the greenhouses, one of the things that happens when you redo the roofs is you reset the light amount. Uh, because whether you had sprayed paint on the top of the roof or just mildew had formed over time, your roofs get darker over time. So when we redid the roofs, the I have a Lux meter in case you don't own one. It's probably not anywhere close by for me to grab, but I have a Lux meter. It just lets me read how much light uh, is coming in and we can use that to kind of make measurements around the different greenhouses and we actually ended up burning a few moonlights or not burning them washing them out which is a precursor to burning them um, on, on one particular bench so we have we have plenty of good looking ones but we did kind of wash out a few and that only took about maybe 36 hours of them being in too much light until we could get the shade cloth back over it and cover it back up so um, that was uh, something to be mindful of if it is going white, whiter than yellow, too much light. If it's going darker green, not enough light. So moonlights are pretty easy to tell your light amount, all that to say. Um, if we're good at growing pink princess, will we ever consider the other ones? Uh, like uh, white princess, wizard, knight, etc. cetera. Um, I do have some white knights white wizards I don't have one even personally right now and white princesses are a phenomenon that I don't know I don't know what makes that different than a white knight or a white wizard I'm, I'm sure Sorry about that. My headset decided I wasn't listening to enough stuff. Um, I'm sure the answer to the question about where they came from is which hybrid they were a part of. Again, teaser for the Pink Princess discussion we'll have pretty soon. But at this point, most of those have to be imported if we were going to grow them or sell them. And um, the only one I currently have in my possession is White Knight. And I have no plan. I don't have nearly enough to to sell so i'm trying to get better about if i know just knowing how many people hit the website every week um if i know there's a plant that i'm only going to have a dozen of i'm just going to not sell them or only sell them in ghost style updates um or keep them in the case of white knight or something like that if we ever did do something with it it'd probably be ebay just um given how how many we would have so hopefully that answers that question um speak about thrips. I think there's a voicemail we can get to about that soon. Um, trying to read through the rest of these. Some people sharing some information about uh, LECA, which is still something I really want to try. I just haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, 
how long should we keep the so uh, the pink princesses in the sh soil it was shipped in? Uh, they can go quite a while, especially if they're able to go vertical. Um, but again, it all depends on your condition. If your house is 68, really cold all the time, uh, you may want to preemptively repot it into something that contains more filler like perlite um, just to have better aeration and better watering schedules. Um, but if you have a, you know, a back patio that warms up or whatever it may be, um, where at least you're getting good cycles of it, the soil becoming wet, the soil drying out, et cetera, et cetera, as long as that's good, um, they are not one that complains about being in too small of a pot. I have some that are 10 feet long of a vine that are still technically in their pot. Uh, in fact, one of the things that's cool about Pink Princess is whenever I go through and do cuttings of Pink Princesses, especially when I'm trying to trim back our stock plants and maybe there's one uh, stem within one of our parent plants that, which we call stock plants, by the way, if you didn't piece that together. Uh, if there's a cutting on that that's uh, growing more aggressively than others, it's typically because it's reverted. Um, they're going to grow faster if they don't have uh, the pink variegation to it. And sometimes I will trim those cuttings, put them in a tray as these cuttings are too big to root into a four inch. Maybe if I can get time to uh, stick them into a larger pot, but they're also completely reverted. So as much as we love selling the Burgundy Princess, it's never our Burgundy Princess is plants that we planted trying to plant pink princesses that just don't have the quality of irrigation that we do uh, for a pink princess at the normal price for the actual pink princesses. So, I, but it's on the flip side, it's not really my intention to ever consistently be growing fully reverted ones. There are some philodendrons in the same family like Dark Lord um, that I'm working on. There's a few other, Bloody Mary I think is one of them, uh, that look very similar to how a reverted pink princess would look um, when it's completely reverted and only burgundy. Um, but those grow a little bit faster if you are actually growing the Dark Lord version instead of the reverted. Anyhow, uh, if I cut those cuttings and leave them in a tray, they can still be 100% viable. And like say I left them in the middle aisle, so they're only getting watered every third day or second day when we turn on the bigger waters that water that whole section. They can, those cuttings can stay viable in that tray, just getting watered every third day without soil for several weeks and still be a, a viable cutting if I wanted to stick it in the future. So once your pink princess's leaf and stem size has gotten big enough, as long as you're providing it moisture by misting, by having humidity, um, and obviously you're not gonna wanna ignore the soil, but the soil tends to have less of an impact um, for good or for bad on the plant as it gets bigger. So hopefully that was a way too elaborate answer to that question. Um, all you guys, thanks for the live stream. All right, let's let's uh, let's jump back to any tips on uh, Delicioso making them fin straight faster. Delicioso just take time. There's literally nothing you can do other than time. Uh, they will, if you got one in a four inch pot, they probably would fenestrate slightly better or slightly faster if put into a six inch pot. Um, but Monsteras can also become extremely root bound before needing to be repotted. But I would say generally you're probably, from the size we were selling them as, you probably have three months to six months. To, again, depends on your weather and your sunlight and stuff but they, they just take time um you got to remember monsteras typically fenstrate and so raphidophora and all uh, most aeroids um that do fenstrate are going to fenstrate based on maturity in time but also maturity in height so that's something else to to just be aware of uh before long you're going to want to get that something to grow up because all aeroids do want to to climb ultimately so um people are just enjoying the q a um how do you make ficus elastica branch out um you can trim them and that can sometimes make them go in a y pattern um but typically they don't branch um you can however take an elastica and trim it stick that and propagate it especially if you have a rooting hormone either powder or gel um elasticas are 
decently easy to propagate and root in, and then you can get multiple plants in the same pot and grow it up. We tend to stick to four inch pots because of their cost to ship and their economics of just being able to actually ship that. Um, on how to make a poll for Pink Princess or Burgundy Princess, Nicole's question. Uh, I want to upload it. I shot a video a while back and posted it in our behind the scenes Facebook group, which at the end of this video, I'll put in the link in the description, whatever you're supposed to do for YouTube. Um, but we just use actual uh, wood. I think there's cedar or pine planks and we get them rough cut from a local um, wood cuttery. I, I know there's a name for it, um, but they cut them to size and we actually had them custom cut to 18 inches and uh, 24 inches, which are the two box sizes that are most common to us. Um, so that when we, instead of using the long stakes like we sometimes do, we can actually lay the entire plant, including totem, into the box and the totem itself will keep the plant from falling on itself when it's in transit. So uh, we don't make like moss poles or anything like that. There are obviously tons of YouTube resources out there for that, but we just use rough cut wood. Um, and the, the key to any pole though, when you're trying to get an aeroid to climb up is you wanna make sure that you're giving it the incentive to climb the pole, whether it's wood or not. So you wanna make sure you're either keeping the totem wet or keeping your pole, your moss on your pole moist, um, and in some ways kind of reducing the water you would put in the soil, um, encouraging it that future moisture is going to come from this new source as it goes vertical. So that's a, a tip for you who are trying to get it to attach or to continue to grow or to really embrace the pole, is make sure you're keeping the pole as a source, source of moisture for the plant. Um, I live in Washington, so my south facing window is basically always cloudy. Um, would that be considered as bright indirect light? Um, direct light is just that, is a sunbeam actually hitting it. So despite you being basically always cloudy, you still want to be careful about the fact that if the cloud moves away and they're in the way of the light, a plant that is not used to getting direct sun that all of a sudden gets direct sun will not like you. So um, as far as it being bright or low light, you can always buy a lux meter. I've been meaning to like make an Amazon link to the one that I, I have a really expensive like commercial grade one and then I have a kind of more, um, I wouldn't say residential, but consumer um, price point and con consumer, it's kind of looks, it's more handheld. The other one's like two different gadgets. Um, and they're actually pretty accurate to each other. It's, it's not, it's like buying a really good thermometer versus regular thermometer. If you're trying to get if the reading of if it's hot or not, it's going to get pretty close. Um, that's always a good thing to know. Um, and you can read up online about what different plants like different Lux, me uh, ratings. Those resources aren't really easy to find, but they are out there. I found them in the past and that's something, I know the biggest question has been soil video is like, I think the next one everybody really wants me to make as far as just like what soil we use and uh, what we recommend for different plants. But one of the things I do wanna do as a follow-up to that, cause I think it's good for everybody to have, uh, it's kind of why I recommended, they're out of reach, but it's kind of why I recommended those two different books in my previous YouTube video and stuff. Um, knowledge is power, knowledge is, uh, is really powerful. So as much as you can learn, um, the better. And in the same way, if you're a scientist or anything else, your equipment um, or a hobbyist, uh, your sewing machine, um, probably doesn't matter when you're starting out, but if you're really trying to get into it, having that much better, I don't know why I picked sewing machine, but much better sewing machine is probably going to give you a better product and give you more control and let you, you know, do more than what you were originally planning to do um and let you grow into that hobby and i think the same applies to plants and th that's going to be a topic of a video in the future because i think if we all were talking the same language if we all had a simple magnifying glass that's good for being able to um, get close-ups of not only leaves but of like pests so when uh, resources online say, well, how many legs does it have or, or other attributes of the pest? Some of that stuff, even to my 
I, um, it's probably not in this drawer, I think it's in my work cart out there, we have like just a little, you know, pocket thumb magnifying glass that we can use to, to look at a, a bug in a slightly better view, um, something like a lux meter, something like a, t a temperature gauge that records historically, um, which I will have some links to and stuff like that, similar to the ones that we use for the weather station. Um, those are all really important tools uh, for you being a better parent to your plants. And if you know what those units of measurement are, what your soil moisture is, how much light exactly they're getting, um, that's going to be a lot more helpful for not only you to view other sor resources that are out there, but also for you to, when we're communicating, you and me, talking about what's going on with your plant, if I knew some of those things and could say, hey, well, I mean, the conditions they came from, was, was this amount of light? Uh, I think that would make a lot of our conversations easier. I don't expect it from people, but I, I do think it's something people should know about if they want to continue their hobby. And I know a lot of people who follow me and follow the greenhouse are small scale at home growers or backyard growers. And um, that's really useful stuff to know um, for your, your growing sake as well. Uh, I am actually, if you guys are cool with it, I'm going to take a quick, like, five minute break real quick, and then I'm going to come back. I just need to get something else to drink and replace the camera on the, or battery on the, the camera, and then I want to go through a, a couple last voicemails and see uh, what other questions I can answer before we get to six o'clock, so... Hopefully that sounds good to you guys. Um, maybe I'll be able to actually listen to a few voicemails real quick. Um, I guess I cannot play my old song, so um, let me let me rechange this note to saying, "Be back at 11:15 or not 11:15." Oh, Shane, come on! Look at that. I know how to do this, guys. Uh, awesome.
already. Sorry about that, guys. Um, was able to respond to that text. Let's go ahead and get another um, voicemail going here. So give me one second to get this queued up. Hi, Shane. This maybe I'm not. Hold on one second, guys. I'm trying to uh, trying to get this figured out. Uh. Let's see here. Did I play this one already? All right. I did play that one. Let's see if I play this one. All righty. Let's let's play this one, guys. Let's play this one. This is uh this should be fun. Hi, Shane. This is Ada from New York City. Um, I recently received my uh, beautiful Superbum Ansarium, and I was wondering what type of potting mix you suggest I, I use to um, repot her, and what do I do with all of those aerial roots? I've only ever seen that in orchids, and I leave them out usually with the orchids, but what do I do with them? in the Ansarium. Um, and I also just wanted to thank you um, for continuing to deliver to us in New York. Um, just thank you. Oh, that's super sweet. Um, and obviously, been praying a lot for uh, for you guys up there and everything you guys are going through. Uh, I know my wife and I were really um, moved by watching some of the um, ways you guys are celebrating your uh, healthcare workers up there and stuff. Um, I just think that's that's really special and shows the good in people. And just remember that good, good is ahead for sure. Um, and I'll definitely keep your, your city in my thoughts and prayers too. Um, as far as repotting uh, super bum, uh, so you're going back into anthuriums. Um, which are an aeroid. So obviously a uh, super bum grows, if you're unfamiliar with it, it goes kind of, it kind of grows upwards. It doesn't uh, vine like um, philodendrons do, but it's still an aeroid. Um, so aerial roots on aeroids are still going to be really, really um, good. So you want to make sure you're leaving those aerial roots uh, visible and you don't want to bury those aerial roots. You can bury them, they will grow more, um, but it's great um, to let them still have access to oxygen. Uh, you can step them up. Just remember, aeroids are going to like um, a soil that is going to be able to drain out within a reasonable amount of time. I recently stepped up a superbum just to see, uh, I think it's actually pronounced superbum, by the way, not super bum, but she said it super bum, and we've kind of always said it super bum. Sometimes, in case you're curious, we do uh, have nicknames for plants because at the end of the day, there was a reason why your elementary school or middle school or high school or college teacher taught you a nickname or a way to remember something because at the end of the day, it helped you remember it. So there are certain plants uh, here at Gabriella Plants that just internally within the team um, we'll have a nickname for and sometimes if you're lucky you'll get uh the nickname written in sharpie on the outside of the foam wrapping sometimes those are the nicknames so uh like raphidophora tetrasperma um which are also excuse me the marketing name monstera minima they're not a monstera you can read our description on our website to get the explanation of that but um they'll write those as minis uh, so anyhow, so we have we have weird nicknames for things, but we'll just refer to it as a super bum. I understand it's technically I think a super bum, but uh, the super bum are going to grow upright, 
and their aerial roots are going to be very important. So as long as your aerial roots are left above the soil line, um, you can get away with overwatering and going to any real size pot that you want to. That being said, anthuriums don't mind being fairly, fairly root bound. Um, in the same way you mentioned that they're kind of like orchids, um, they work very similar to how orchids work too. They are able to get both moisture and oxygen out of those aerial roots. Uh, in the same way I said pink princess can survive as a cutting, uh, your anthuriums and things can survive root bound or with very minimal soil moisture uh, if their aerial roots are able to kind of make up for that lack of moisture and lack of airflow. So uh, if you have the aerial roots and the superbums, superbums that we do sell um, are big enough uh, and they're not root bound yet, but they're, they are well rooted and well established in that size pot um, they are good to stay in that pot for a considerable amount of time um, and you can also step them up and i'll keep you posted i wish i had a photo with me i meant normally i have a slideshow for these things but i really just wanted today to be a q a and uh maybe we can do this more often because i really like it so um yeah so you know, hopefully that answers your question um you can kind of repot it um in a normal soil mixture um and theriums also i know uh enid i don't know her exact mixture down at nse tropicals i know that she uses kind of a her own blend of um uh, bark fibers that are pulled apart apart to where they're just the individual fibers uh part of part mix of that part mix of actual bark part perlite and then a little bit of vermiculite to be able to hold some moisture and she just kind of foregoes the peat altogether on a lot of her aeroids, um, that's also acceptable. So there's a pretty wide range of, uh, of things you could do with this uh, anthurium. The biggest thing, just wanna make sure you leave those aerial roots um, right where they are and make sure that even if you're not watering the plant a lot that you're misting um, and having good airflow in general, you don't wanna over moisten the aerial roots, but that's gonna be a really big key to the, the plant health, so. Um, and yeah, you're in, in chat. Um, yeah, and New York, New York people are wonderful. Um, Miriam and I, my wife, uh, went there a couple, what, a year ago? She'll probably laugh. I think she's watching this, but we went there September of not, not this past year. Anyhow, I think, no, this September this past year. Yeah, so we were just up there. Um, very cool. Um... Let's go ahead and play this uh, this voicemail, and then we'll go through a couple more texts, and then uh, maybe we'll wrap it up for today. Hi, Shane. Uh, this is Jeannie from Loveland, Ohio. I'm wondering if um, if you know anything about uh, Epsom salts being beneficial to Hoyas, and if you could explain why they might be beneficial and how often we should use them. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, to be honest, that is a question I do not know the answer to. Um, I would assume, no, I, I don't want to make assumptions. I honestly don't know the answer to that. I wish I did. Um, I know that Hoya, there are things that you can do to get the pH a little bit better, but I don't know if Epsom salt have to do with pH at all. I don't, don't see how salt would affect your pH. I, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I will look into it. And uh, maybe we can answer that next time around because I'm honestly a little bit curious now that you've uh, now that you've asked. So I don't want to sit here Googling on stream, but I will certainly make some Google searches and see what I can find out. Um, cool. All right, let's go to some text here. Is it normal for a plant to arrive with a yellowed leaf? Um, Depends on the plant, depends on the context of how many leaves are on the plant. But if you ever have an issue with any order, email orders at gabriellaplants.com. And especially with a photo of the entire plant top down, not just the single leaf. And that lets us know the context of the entire story of where, um, of where your plant is. And there are obviously going to be minor shipping damages. Um, 
sometimes Hoyas. I know the Australia Australis we sent out last week had really, really long renders, and I don't like to preemptively trim them in the same way that I don't like to preemptively trim off yellow leaves on a pink princess or anything, uh, because I don't want to be adding shock right before, or I don't want to be adding a, an environmental change right before boxing it up and sending it. Um, but we are going, we just made the call not to trim those back. Um, if they didn't make it, um, we're sorry about that. Um, you definitely don't want to pay the shipping if we have to go to a box over 18 inches long. Um, but know that they will come back. You can always trim them back, especially at the next enter node. Uh, and they will, you know, a Hoya, for example, will grow back out of that. But as referred to a, a yellow leaf on a plant, it is important to know the entire context of the of the plant. So we always recommend whenever you're making a claim or just curious uh, that you send us not only a close up of the issue that you see, specifically the single yellow leaf or whatever, but also the entire context of the plant is helpful for us to know um, what our role is in helping to take care of you. So some people in chat seem to know what Epsom salt uh, does and it has to do with the magnesium. I believe that. I totally believe the magnesium thing. We also generally don't have to add, I'm clicking this pen for no reason. Uh, we generally don't have to add a whole lot to our water or anything to correct for pH or minerals for the most part because we're well water within Florida. So we have high iron, um, not extraordinarily high magnesium, but you know, there's enough. We don't filter the water coming out of the ground. It's an agricultural well. Um, and that tends to tends to do pretty well. There are specific plants that, like I said, obviously the the Epsom salt does not influence pH, but or maybe it does, but that's not the reason. Um, but there are certain plants that need a little bit um, different pH than the soil we use. And when we do that, we'll use powdered lime um, from limestone uh, to even out that pH for those couple plants, uh, specifically spiders. The plants in the spider family do that. Um, Ficus elastica taniki losing its variegation. Um, if it's going whiter, too much light. If it's going shorter uh, areas of variegation on the edges of the leaf and they're more white than they are cream, and that area is shrinking and the, the solid color in the center of the leaf is expanding, um, that's too much light. If you're getting a more cream color and not as much white um, and you're noticing that the cream is almost coming out more green to a certain extent, um, that could be not enough light. Um, so those are the two kind of ways to tell on the Tanikis. Of course, my wife was able to remind me, yes, I know it was our for our anniversary. She was so sweet. My wife, um, I play, I only play one video game and that I should say I used to play one video game. I still do some nights, but um, obviously work has kind of taken over my life the past year and a half getting to know you guys. Um, but the game I sometimes do play is Overwatch and uh, we normally go up to Asheville for our anniversary. It's where we did our honeymoon. Um, but she, because of the timing of the uh, the Overwatch League, which is a sports esports league for that video game, they were doing their grand finals in Philly uh, right around our anniversary. So we actually went up, um, kind of made a deal with her that we uh, were going to go to New York for the first couple days and then uh, head over to Philly. And I was able to see a, a friend that was my first roommate ever uh, while I was in Philadelphia as well. So that is that is neat. Um, do we have any plans to sell Ficus Elastica, however you pronounce Altisma? Um, no plans. I haven't heard of that one yet. I know, um, man, there's another one, the green and green variegated one. I really want to get my hands on that, but as of this point, I don't have any, any source for it. Um, a lot of those plants, a lot of the things that are trendy and that you, when you search on Etsy, you can only find one and it's exceedingly expensive if it's in the United States or it's almost too good to be true price rise, but it's coming from overseas. Um, those are typically the plants that are, I, I won't call them import only, but they're not currently being produced at any real scale in the United States. And uh, for a long time, White Knights, uh, Thai Constellations were like that for a little while. Um, those are always gonna be plants that I tend to shy away from just because personally, um, I don't really like 
we changed this a little bit with trying to support other growers more. Um, but in general, I like that what we do here is kind of unique because we grow what we sell um, and we grow it here in our family greenhouse and then ship it straight literally from the, the time it sits on the bench, uh, then gets brought up to the front greenhouse um, in our kind of inventory holding area. So we isolate it from other plants. Um, other than the plant shipping out that week, we can keep a better eye on it for any developing issues. Um, and then Wesley, a member of our team, will bring them all in the night before and set them into this building that we're in, our shipping and offices, and the shippers then ship them out. So in general, I haven't in the past really ever gotten into importing. I don't see any problem with it for people who do, but I just personally have never made importing part of the routine of what we do here. Um, so a lot of the plants that are harder to like we get we got asked a lot on Instagram since we're growing the um, true eyes the moonlights the the lighter form we got asked a lot if we we're gonna be growing the darker form and I don't have any darker form and the really the only way to get it right now in the United States is to import it um, so then you're either gonna import a handful and not spend a lot of money on it and know that it's a very long-term project which we have done on a couple plants there's probably 25 species that I bought in, you know, one or two of just so that I could begin to work on their propagation, not even with plans to sell them, but just so I have more experience in how they grow. Um, but I generally like to do that. So I, I probably won't ever, I won't say ever, but at this point, it's not part of our routine to import a hundred of something let them grow out. Obviously, we would never bring them in as an import and reship them, uh, but we don't even really bring them in, grow them out to a specific pot size and ship them out. Well, we don't typically do that with imports. So um, just something to know on some of the species that are harder to find. We may not um, be the one to, to get on that train, at least early on. Once other growers import things and they're growing from self-sufficient cuttings in the United States, it makes it a lot easier uh, for us to not only get the plant in if we wanted to buy it from some of those growers, but that also lets us uh, get to the point where we could buy in a larger plant, like an eight inch basket or something, um, like we were able to do with Rituza and a, a couple other ones. And we still support the other growers that grow those, um, but it was something we were able to finally kind of get in cuttings of and at least have a baseline number of plants that we're producing every month from our own stockpile. I guess that's a trendy term right now. Um, let's see, family is from Asheville, very cool. Um, you love the Gabriella plants. Mug, very cool. Yes, uh, we'll probably be doing a lot more really cool merch. Um, stay tuned for that. All right, cool. So that's uh, that's most of the chat questions. Let's uh, answer a few more of these texts and then uh, we'll call it for today. Unless you, if you have any final thoughts, feel free to throw them in the chat and I'll try to read them. Uh, let's read this. All right, another um, fellow grower that I know, um, Kim, is watching and she says, what's the biggest challenge during the whole pandemic and how are you guys holding up? Um, if you didn't read my letter or if you haven't read my letter last night, it will probably be a blog post on the website at some point so people on Instagram and stuff can have the link to it. Uh, it was sent out in our our wiz, our, um, our on our email platform and is also in the Facebook behind the scenes group. But I try to make those longer form uh, kind of my perspective on my job and how it's um, changed over time. You got to remember I'm 25 and our team has grown from never doing online wholesale only uh, three employ three part time employees plus myself to now there's uh, 14 people. I think eight or nine of those people are full time. Uh, and obviously myself too, and the team has grown, uh, what we're able to do, sorry, my, my nose is so itchy today. Um, but our team has, has grown and what we're able to do. So, um, I try to write updates about me personally, um, in longer form written ways. So hopefully you can check out that letter or whatever, as far as what's the challenge and kind of answering the question, what's the challenge, what's the. Um, how are we holding up? We're holding up really well at this point. All of our staff is healthy. Um, we said in that uh, 
in that letter, or I wrote in that letter, that uh, we were able to extend um, sick time, sick paid leave to our employees, paid time off, our, our normal PTO policy started at the beginning of the year for employees full time longer than 90 days. Um, those things are really, really uncommon in agriculture. If they are in agriculture, it's typically big, big companies or garden centers, typically not agricultural producers. Um, so it's, it's really neat to be able to, to take care of the staff in that way um, that we know uh, that if anyone does get sick, uh, if we had at this point, we are not under any mandate that uh, makes us to uh, have to close our doors. We did have to suspend our local pickups, just not only um, to try to be compliant with um, the Orange County order, even though we're not located in Orange County. Uh, we also just, you know, uh, trying to take care of the team a little bit. Um, and we may open that back up in the future. Obviously, we're not doing local events. We don't have the big events here at the greenhouse and the events that we had out in the community got obviously postponed or canceled. So uh, we haven't been able to have that. But as far as how we're holding up, um, we're really blessed. And I can't say thank you enough. I've seen a ton of other uh, shop owners say how, you know, how it, since they're closed, people should uh, consider um, purchasing from us and uh, that always warms my heart and you know we've continued to grow we have grown over the past year at rates that I can't believe to be quite honest with you um, and that hasn't stopped because of the pandemic um, I don't know if that's because people are trying to buy plants at home and, and we're just set up to be able to do that um, or if you know it's just part of our continued growth and it's just what we should normally expect and we're just not seeing any negative effects from it but at this point everything's good we're healthy we're able to do what we love to do and we're able to take care of our staff or I'm able to take care of the staff and that's what matters to me so in that sense we're holding up really well and the second part of that letter is was me just kind of recognizing what I deemed as my personal responsibility or, or a goal of mine um, to be able to have better communications. Part of that letter was talking about how I gave away a lot of my job and, and finally was able to delegate delegate more uh, responsibilities to other team members. Um, and that's freed up my time to make more content, do stuff like this, um, and, and other things that need to happen on the back end, accounting, and all the, all the lovely things that are, that are businesses. Um, but in having some time, one of my personal responsibilities, or I've kind of taken it upon myself to try to be in contact with other growers here locally that don't have um, a retail facing. So a lot of that traditional growing wholesale industry is hurting a lot worse than we are right now because either the trucks aren't allowed to get to a specific place or that garden center itself is currently closed due to local restrictions or whatnot. Um, so I've been trying to be more um, mindful of what those growers have in overstock because this is when you talk about the pandemic and how it applies to um, to agriculture specifically, uh, especially like horticulture, not necessarily food production, um, their crops, just like food, um, they don't go bad. I can technically step up a plant into a larger pot, um, but depending on the size pot you step it to, you may be running out of bench space. I mean, these growers have schedules and pre-booked orders that go out the entire springtime. And this is when you spent all winter long planting your crops and like beginning of March through end of May is like the time to be shipping that across the country as people warm up. So um, those growers right now with not having as many places to ship it, um, some plants that we ne didn't think we were going to be able to get um, or that we would have never guessed a grower having an issue getting rid of or, or selling um, are not moving. So we're, I'm trying personally to reach out to as many growers as I can, uh, parts of the wholesale industry and see what they have, what is the biggest way we can help them. You know, maybe there's plants we get from specific growers, but that's not what they need to move more. Um, if you notice like two weeks ago, we started selling four inch 
um, Dutch Anthuriums that are blooming in different colors. And those are like very minimal margin for us from the price that we paid from the grower to what we were selling them for. And we did that just to be able to help um, that particular greenhouse clear out some of the plants they need to uh, clear out to make room for other things. So I've kind of made it my own goal to, to try to help growers where we can. Obviously, we grow plenty of plants ourselves, but um, we will continue to grow. We will continue to hire more shippers, increase the shipping capacity. Um, we, we went all of, I know this is rambling, but hopefully you enjoy it. This is kind of my thoughts. I was going to start the whole broadcast with this, but I'm glad it kind of came up from you, Kim, and uh, we'll move on to a few more before we end. But the uh, we grow a lot of plants, and before we moved into this building, which is 3,000 square feet inside of this building here, um, about 1,000 of it is for one use, and then the main office is about 2,000 square feet. Before we moved into that, which was November of last year-ish, is when we actually got to move into here, um, we were shipping out of about 380 square feet, so probably smaller than your master bedroom of your house. And because we only had that much space that was air conditioned and that had internet and computers and stuff like that, um, we could only really have two, maybe three people working in shipping. Um, so that put a really hard cap of our shipping capacity at like 800 plants. There was just no possible way short of having like day shift and night shift or trying to do it on Saturday or, or figuring out other ways to increase capacity. In a normal working environment, we just couldn't do any more than 800. Uh, that was just a hard cap. And this past week and the week before that were relatively close, but um, the team of shippers who was two and is now four who work in this room now, um, that team shipped over 2,100 plants um, each week for the past two weeks or around 2,000 plants for the past two weeks. So um, that not only lets us obviously it's growing. That's how our business grows, shipping more plants, growing more plants. And we always had way more room. If we were only shipping 800 a, a week and we have growing capacity to grow 20, 20 to 30,000 plants at a time in our greenhouses alone, they're really, we would, we weren't moving enough to be able to justify, you know, planting larger batches. It was very, if you think inventory updates sell out quickly now, which I know that they do, um, you should have seen it back then. Uh, they sold out very quickly because w the number of plants we could sell of each species was just so low. So um, we've been able to grow um, in our shipping capacity, and I think that will be what we continue to do moving forward, um, trying to get more people uh, to be able to ship plants so we can not only continue to grow our business, but to help the other growers, like I mentioned. So, Kim, that's kind of how we're holding up. We're very blessed, and as I say a lot, I can't say thank you enough to the plant community for embracing me and embracing our business and understanding who we are and why we do what we do. Um, it's just, it's absolutely incredible, and I can't say thanks enough, so. Um, all right, I'm just reading through a couple more. I think my headset's about to die, which may uh, may kind of cut our thing short. Um, some people had some recommendations on different um, like lighting conditions and what plants work best. Um, somebody asked, good afternoon. I was wondering how we can help you out more during this time. Um, like I said, we're really blessed. Um, the number one thing you can do is keep taking care of your plants and keep having a passion for plants. The number one thing I hear from other growers is that their fear is that people, because they're they're mentally focused on something else, uh, will lose their passion in plants, and that would have a much bigger impact than whatever this temporary thing we have right now is is going to be. Um, so the biggest way you can help everybody is stay passionate, stay active in the Facebook groups, uh, stay active in talking to other plant people. Um, and I'm going to make certain that we send out an email uh, when most of the nationwide bands do get lifted, just saying, hey, if you do order from us, but you used to also frequent your local plant shop, call them, see if they have 
uh, if they have reopened yet, if you can go in there and help them um, get started back up because a lot of those places are going to need support to be able to come up with the money to make that first order again to get plants in and to resume business. So um, you can help us by continuing to support the overall plant community. And obviously every order is important to us and, and we love that. Um, but we're also limited as far as, you know, we can only do so much. So, but that's ways you can help. Um, we are going to, I am actively trying to figure out a way to put some type of donation. Uh, I need to figure out what, what cause we're going to give to, because I really want to make sure it goes directly to people who are going without some necessities right now. Um, not necessarily, I don't want to, personally, I don't want to invest, um, Gabriella's, um, contributions or our customers contributions into finding a cure or to a uh, vaccine that kind of thing um, i much rather help people in a much more physical and meaningful sense um, so if i can find something that nationwide i know of multiple good organizations in orlando that are doing that but i want to make sure i can find something nationwide that's helping uh, to put food on the tables for people who are going without some necessities so if i can find something like that we'll probably do something at checkout where if you click the button it donates five dollars and we'll match that five dollars up to a certain threshold or something we'll find a way to to help people through this as much as we can um tips for tiny dancers best way to get rid of fungus gnats those are great two questions and we can i think kind of wrap it up after that um tiny dancers um don't be shocked when they lose and this goes for any alocasia don't be sh shocked when they lose leaves at roughly the same pace that they um, gain new ones at. Um, that's how they grow and they can only sustain so many leaves at one time. So don't be afraid of that. Uh, if the leaves are yellowing a bit too much, uh, they also love their fertilizer. So make sure your, your nutrients are on point. Uh, if their leaves are yellowing, it could be too much light. So, um, that's, that's a simple, simple help for the tiny dancers. And obviously if you're help having a specific issue, let me know via email, uh, orders at gabriellaplants.com or mine is Shane at Gabriella Plants. And we'll, I'll try to help you with a, a photo of the specific issue. Uh, as far as best way to get rid of fungus gnats, we get asked that a lot. Easiest thing, go to your kitchen spice cabinet and get out the thing you probably don't use a whole lot, cinnamon. Uh, cinnamon and sprinkle a tiny bit goes a long way just on the top of the soil of the plant. Um, that is a great way to cut down on fungus gnats, a uh, natural deterrent to them and it doesn't cause any harm to the plant and it makes your plant smell really great. Now obviously if you don't want to have cinnamon out there because you have a beautiful uh, orchid that's blooming uh, or something else that you want to appreciate the scent of, uh, the other thing you can do is uh, really simple. You can take the pot and kind of using your finger, uh, if you remember what tilling is in a garden where you aerate the soil, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, break up the top layer of soil. Um, fungus gnats will typically live if the soil is remaining moist. There's actually like a thin layer of um, algae, even if not visible, that's growing on the top layer of the soil. And that's normally where fungus gnats are going to be attracted to. So one, you can let the plant dry out. Um, but if you can't let it dry out at least enough to get rid of fungus gnats, cinnamon is a great alternative. You can also always put, whether it's straight perlite on top of the soil, um, some people put moss on top of the soil, like sphagnum moss, um, any of those types of things uh, will also help. And I've heard a lot of people recommend uh, like mosquito bits or whatever, the, the little sticks that you can put in the soil too. Um, but those are hopefully a couple different answers to that question. Uh, let's see. Best way to save an overwatered plant. If you know it's overwatered and it's not drying out or your pot doesn't have enough drainage to it, um, trying to get that fixed as soon as you can. The biggest thing you can do to a plant that's being overwatered is give it a pot with better drainage. Even if that means going to a nursery pot um, or getting out a drill with your spare time and making more holes in your specific pot uh, or adding a very, very thick layer of rock to the bottom of your pot if it does only have one drainage hole. Um, anything you can do to make sure the drainage, the water getting out of the medium um, is happening as quickly as you can because any traditional potting soil, whether it's something like we use or even something that's a little bit more airy, um, they're all gonna have, whether it's vermiculite that's holding in the moisture or Canadian peat that's holding in the moisture. There's gonna be something holding in some amount of moisture. 
um, but those soils are also meant to drain. They're meant to go to the bottom of the pot and then retain the moisture um, that that particular medium or that particular mix holds. So if you don't have good aeration, um, good drainage of the pot, that's the best thing you can do for something that is overwatered. I can't get to, there's like 97 something texts in here, but I'm just going through a couple rapid fire. Um, I've wondered what the cuttings look like when they arrive at the nursery before they're planted in dirt. Um, where do you order the cuttings and plants from? We Everything we grow from cuttings, we grow from our own stock plants. So the baskets in um, the videos that we've played um, that are hanging down above the benches, sometimes it's just plants on benches. Um, all of those serve, we keep a certain amount, again, stock is the term we use, but parent plants, we keep a certain number of parent plants on hand to be able to plant self-sufficient cuttings. Uh, we never, I, I can't remember the last time we bought in cuttings from somewhere. Um, I've, growing up, my dad would always buy in, um, we used to not grow nearly as many species as we do right now, but my dad, um, growing up would sometimes get in batches of like marble queen cuttings or jade we were mainly growing pothos philodendron stuff and boston ferns was like all we really grew um so he would like maybe every third year get in new cuttings of jade and marble queen and golden uh just to kind of reset the quality if he felt like either due to lack of care or just general aging our variegation had kind of faded over time or we hadn't done quite a good enough job of keeping up um replacing our stock plants we got to the point where we didn't have as many stock plants as we needed we maybe bought some cuttings in but we would always buy them in locally not from a source just from another another greenhouse that we knew that was also growing that item so um, but that's been a very long time i don't i can't recall that ever happening since i took over the business in 2017 as far as the plants that we do get in in baby form that we don't do from cuttings um, we get those in from tissue culture labs that are cloning the plant and providing them in starters if you remember the birkin starters we were selling the small ones um, we'll get trays of certain plants that you can't grow with from propagation or at least not as easy like tanniki or uh man a ton tons of different plants sense of areas different plants where um, it's a lot easier for them to make that in a lab environment and, and ship those out so um, due to respecting other growers and their their wishes, we don't discuss publicly the the sources for the labs that do create tissue culture baby plants. But um, they're out there, and there's some in all countries. Um, and if you're the really big kids, uh, like Costa, the people who distribute stuff to Lowe's and Home Depot, you may even have your own lab in house. Um, but we don't have that here so and if you're not familiar with tissue culture we'll make a whole video on that you can also youtube that there's great resources out there for that but basically you're you're clone you're taking a very small piece of a plant treating it with the right hormones in a lab environment or the right mixture or whatever i again i'm not trained in that um in order to rapidly um like cell mutation like rapidly uh propagate more or uh clone more plants and then you take them from very tweezer size and those labs will grow them out into being the viable plant that then we would plant into our plants so um yeah so that but most of everything we do from cuttings is from our own cuttings um are you offering are you planning on offering some rare stuff like rare anthuriums or variegated peace lilies rare is a very subjective term i mean obviously we're one of the biggest growers of pink princess and they are very rare if you put them up next to a hoya or any other plant that's commonly out there um there is a growing section on the home page of our website that typically has what's coming up but i have been slowly growing kind of like i said i'm I'll never be somebody, a lot of the rare things or the, the most trending things you see right now are people who are going to come or buying in 50 plants from overseas, importing them, stepping them up into a pot, waiting a month, three months if you're a good grower, uh, in my opinion, and then reselling them or at least some time to make sure that there's no issues with the plant before reselling them. Um, that's just something we've never, we've never done. Um, so that kind of limits how many how quickly we'll be with the trendy plants. But there are a number of philodendrons, Dark Lord I mentioned earlier, um, a number of other ones um, that we have growing and that some of them we will have by summer of this year. And some of them I only have two plants, but give me the rest of 2020 and I'm sure by 2021, 
uh, I'll be able to have turned those plants into enough plants to uh, sell and produce a certain amount. But that's kind of uh, our hold up on a lot of that is we want to make sure we have enough of something before we sell it. Um, variegated rope or reverse variegated rope, maybe at one time, um, but not currently in the plans. Um, let's do one more question here if I can find something. Um, okay, cool. Uh, this person just, this is the last question. I'll read a couple chats and we'll just call it good because this has been two hours of you guys being very patient and for whatever reason listening. So uh, I thank you for that. And like I said, it's, it's an amazing opportunity to be able to do this. Um, and hopefully it'll get better over time. And um, I want to be able to bring in staff and, and do these with staff and stuff too in the future. Um, but this uh, final question says, um, I remember you recommended a few books a while back. I can't remember what they were. At the end of this stream, I will put those books in the description, the links to them. Uh, one of them's a houseplant guide. And I can't remember the other ones like a plant glossary, but I'll, I'll put the links specifically to those books uh, and the, the pruning shears I use, a couple of the other links. Uh, you can also find them by going to gabriellaplants.com. In the top left left hand corner, uh, there will be a uh, the menu icon. You can click that and then under growing tips or resources, it may be called now. Uh, under resources, there are the links to those books that you're asking about. So I'll put them in the description as soon as the stream ends, but otherwise um, you can find them on our website and I'll try to keep uh, updating with that and any other recommended like items. Again, when I get to the point where I can recommend a Lux meter or a humidifier, or things like that, um, I'll, I'll definitely put those links in the description so we're all on the same page. Uh, with that being said, um, Sorry, I cannot get to all of your questions. Um, Catherine, thank you for the um, thank you for the support and for following us. Um, uh, plants do keep us positive, 100%. Uh, mosquito bits do work. Yep. Um, cinnamon works as well. Um, if you have time to talk about spider mites, uh, spider mites are the worst. We'll definitely talk about that in a future video. I have a whole pest related video, um, but a lot of what we use here at the greenhouses for pesticides are stuff that is not as is not amazon or in lowe's as far as what you can go buy it's not that we have any we don't really spray anything that requires your special license if you go to a greenhouse supply store online you can find these pesticides but they're certainly not um, recommended for home application so um, me and bruce uh one of our growers in the greenhouse we're we're currently working on doing some tests uh with uh not residential, uh, consumer marketed uh, things for different pests so we can have a better way to recommend the things we do think works. But spider mites are hard. Um, most bugs are hard. And the biggest thing I see with people with bugs is one application will not eradicate them because they are able to live in juvenile and larva uh, form in spots and crevices you didn't realize before. So multiple applications is always the way to go, regardless of what pest uh, or issue you're having. Obviously read the label. You don't want to over, uh, there's certain pesticides even at the greenhouse. We can't spray more than once a week um, or risk burning the plant from the, the chemical. So you want to make sure you're reading the label, but uh, don't think one solution is, is good, especially for spider mites. So, all right, with that, thank you guys. Um, for all your time i can't say thank you enough for just how awesome uh these streams have grown to be i haven't even seen how many people are are in here but i'm sure it was quite a few of you guys and if you're watching this back later thank you too um every little bit helps and we'll continue to do uh, more content and more uh ways to get you guys involved and i think uh just the voicemail concept of being able to hear some of your voices and that kind of thing maybe one day i'll get um, enough confidence to want to do like a live call or something. But um, I really appreciate all your guys' time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, play the drone clip one more time just to play us out. Um, but thank you so much for watching the stream. And I hope to talk to you guys soon. If you have any questions or more feedback, um, the text number that we had uh, in the description does not work for normal phone calls. So don't try to uh, resolve order issues with that. 
email is always best, orders at gabriellaplants.com, or if you want to shoot me a private message, shane at gabriellaplants.com, that's the best way to get a hold of me. Uh, I can't always answer as quickly as I want to, but I will, will not lose track of an email uh, compared to not being able to keep up with chat or keep up with uh, social media like in Instagram. I can't always find my way back to the message I meant to respond to. So email is always best. Um, thank you guys, and we'll do it soon. Um, it means the world to me. So enjoy uh, these couple, these last couple shots, and have a good night, guys. And have a safe weekend. I love each other, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Mm -hmm.